going to be looking at Psalm 4, but it's generally regarded that these two Psalms go together, that the Psalm 3 is really an introduction, you may say, to Psalm 4. And we can see the circumstances in which these two Psalms were inspired by God and came to David uh, by the headings at the top of the first Psalm 3 there, where it says, a Psalm of David, when he fled from Absalom, his son. And that says an awful lot in a few words. You can imagine the thoughts and the feelings that uh, David was experiencing at that time. Everything in David's life up to this point seemed to be running fairly smoothly. And there he was, raised from being a shepherd in Israel to being the king of Israel, blessed of God. And then suddenly it would seem, very suddenly, he becomes aware of this rebellion of his much esteemed and much beloved son, Absalom, something he didn't in a hundred years, you may say, expect. And suddenly at the same time, he finds himself with just a few who remain loyal to him, fleeing for his very life. Some have said that this amounted to the worst day in David's life. I don't know, I hope you haven't had such a day in your lives, but perhaps all of us have some inkling or some experience even of what we might call the worst day of our life. And that's the sort of situation that lies behind these two Psalms. Um, in this Psalm 3, it begins, first verse, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me and we can understand and see and follow on the thoughts that were in David's mind. This is the first psalm we might just say one or two general things about it though before we go any further into its real subject and message. You notice that it's um, the first psalm of which there is any heading given. Uh, it's the same the third one, and then it continues in the fourth psalm, and so on, a heading. And in some Bibles, you don't get these headings. Uh, it's not to say that they're all heretical, they don't have the headings, but it is to say they should have the headings, because the Church of Jesus Christ, believing people down through the centuries, have believed and taught that these Headings are part of the inspiration. They're part of the inspired word of God. And they have much to teach us. So they shouldn't really be missed to be missed out because they're important. They're put there by the Spirit of God. We may say something else uh, at the beginning. The, um, the, set, the fourth psalm is headed up to the chief musician on Neginoth, that means upon a string instrument. Uh, I don't think that's uh, giving us any leeway about people strumming guitars and so on in churches and chapels. Uh, they, 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 it, it's a very uh, wide description, really. It probably means an instrument that was played with strings uh, in uh, held in the hand, but then people have said, you know, our very lives are instruments in the hand of God, as a musician might touch the strings of his instrument and make them bring forth sweet music. So our lives should be in the hands of God to, as it were, bring forth from our lives sweet music music or worthy deeds and noble deeds and so on. We should be in the hands of God. And uh, it's uh, headed up in the third Psalm and therefore a Psalm of David. And you know that we're indebted to David uh, for so many 
of these psalms. Now, the circumstances we've already touched on, but you can read the full description of these circumstances in the uh, second book of Samuel. Two chapters are given to it. Such was the uh, momentous occasion uh, and the teaching that lie behind it in 2 Samuel 15 and 16. You see all the treachery uh, of Absalom in those two chapters and you see other details as well. You, you read about uh, uh, Shimei, the Benjaminite who uh, followed after David, uh, calling him names and throwing stones at him uh, as he left. Come out, come out, thou bloody man, uh, and uh, thou, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial, it says, thou man of blood, come out. Uh, and it goes on, I read a bit more from Samuel 16, it says, The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned, and the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a man of blood. These were terrible uh, uh, assertions that this man was making. Uh, and so you can imagine uh, how David uh, was to feel in, in this. But in spite of all that, in this um, third psalm, I'm going back to the third psalm again, David begins to cope with it, you might say. The worst day of his life, yes. But then it says in verse 4, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah, by the way, Selah we generally say means uh, ponder this, think about this, take notice of this. This is something uh, to, to not skim over lightly. Pause and think about it. And think about that. Here's David in such dire straits. And what does he do? I cried unto the Lord with my voice. And, and he testified, he heard me out of his holy hill. And then, if that's not enough, Verse 5, I laid me down and slept. I awakened, for the Lord sustained me. You could say that's quite something, that after a day like he had had, he was able to sleep at night. I don't think many of us, perhaps, would have done that. We'd have been tossing and turning all night. But it was a remarkable gift that God gave him. He laid down and slept. And, and the next psalm, Psalm 4, is a testimony to a new spirit that was within him, as it were, the next day. How he was able, we'll touch on this a bit more later on in the sermon, but after this peaceful night, you might say, uh, with all this going on, he sleeps and he awakens to the light of a new day with new vigor a positive David now after the broken David of the day before there are many stories that can illustrate this kind of thing and no doubt there are times in your life and in mine when we've been right down at rock bottom and the Lord has miraculously you may say wonderfully brought us up this is a story well known of Martin Luther you know I'm sure everybody heard about him going to, to stand before the Diet of Worms. All the great leaders of the, the age in his day, kings, princes, prelates and bishops and all these other people. And he's going there to answer his case. And you can imagine as he makes his way there, he's been summoned to appear by all expectations would be a court that would sentence him to death. He's on his way to hear people destroying him, really, uh, criticizing him, telling him he's a heretic, telling him he's, he's not worthy to live, and then pronouncing the death sentence upon him. That's how it appeared to him as he makes his way to that place. And, and as he's getting near to it and the apprehension is mounting, uh, and the fear, overwhelming. 
one of his friends sends a message to him and it read just a few words it said this do not enter Worms don't go into that city you know it will be certain death and you imagine how it cast him down he knew he knew it but now it's there black and white as it were in the words of this friend um, but then after a short reflection a short intervention of the spirit of god he ponders on what has been said and he writes down a message back to his good friend and says this tell tell your master it was a servant who who, who brought it that even if there should be as many devils and worms as tiles upon the housetops i'm still going to enter it it's as if from the depths god raised him up again uh, and gave him renewed courage and strength to go on and though it was a terrible experience there he he survived it and this is the kind of thing that you find here in this uh, these two psalms the second psalm number four uh, says um, hear me when i call O god of my righteousness and then here it is thou hast enlarged me when i was in distress i was right down but uh, the lord lifted me up churned up but there it was now have you experienced anything like that you know if you're sailing along the canal it's a strange illustration of what i want to say but you may be going along in a boat on the canal and then you come to a lock and um, you get into the lock and if you've ever done that you feel your boat it depends which way you're going but you feel your boat going down and down and down and behind you the lock gate shuts with a thud and before you there's a lock gate closed and you can hear the water gurgling around you it's as if you're descending into a pit and there's no way out forwards or backwards but then again it seems miraculously but it's not the water begins to level out or fill up whichever way you're going and the gate before you opens and you sail out into a new section new section of life you may say it's like that in life isn't it like that in the psalmist's life he's going along suddenly the gate closes in front of him then he goes down into the depths the waters swirl about him and then the gate opens and there he is in a new a new section of life as it were goes well the scripture says before i was afflicted i went astray and there are times when affliction can change the whole direction of our life for good john newton put it in the lines of a hymn that strangely doesn't seem to have appeared in any recent hymn book it's not even in gatsby's afflictions though they seem severe in mercy oft are sent they stop the prodigal's career and cause them to repent and that can happen can't it somebody else said when god shuts the door he opens the window and god shuts the door he very often opens a window anyway we find blessing sometimes in the buffetings and sorrows of life and then let's move to verse 2 of our psalm 4 O ye sons of men how long will you turn my glory into shame how long will you love vanity and seek after leasing or lies as that means sila well we sometimes ask that question don't we how long will it seem that trouble strife bad things seem to seem to go on how long does it seem that evil will have the upper hand uh, that bad men will take the reins uh, and it's like that in our in our country today is it not you know we 
we, things seem to go from bad to worse. I don't really want to be making political statements, but uh, we've had a week of uh, riots and uh, terrible discontent coming from all directions. And um, we wonder what is going on around us. How long will men love vanity, seek after lies and so on? And, and never mind the, the last week's events, I don't dismiss them easily, but on a bigger picture, how long will this hostility towards our Christian faith, Christian principles, Christian truths, the Christian message, how long will it go on? We see our church is in many ways diminishing, not that they're all diminishing, I say that because some are flourishing, good churches that is. But generally, there has been, for decades it seems, a falling away and people despising the things of God and saying terrible things and devising all kinds of obstacles in the way. And Christian people deride it. And you say something uh, about the truth of the Bible and you're either mocked or laughed at or silenced in some way or another. How long will it go on? Oh, ye sons of men. How long will you turn my glory into shame? Remember, David is a type of Christ. <laughs> and when David says, how long will you turn my glory into shame? If you could read that as, how long will Christ's name be mocked and derided and so on? And how long will men love vanity and seek after lies? And they forget, don't they, that our Christian faith has been for generations the bedrock of our society. It, it, it has given us wise laws. King Alfred based our laws, as everybody knows, on the Ten Commandments. And for centuries that was the case. But now men think there's something better than that. Of course it isn't, but they do that. And uh, that is the, the situation. There is profound ignorance of what our Christian faith has given us, I, I, I haven't really got time to do this, but I, I, I got a list here of uh, 20, 20 points. You're going to be here all afternoon, but I know what time this service is supposed to end, and I'll keep to it. But you, you, I just mentioned them. Hospitals. They, they did have hospitals before Christianity. Ah, very, 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 very few of them. And nothing like what we understand as a hospital today. But real kinds of hospitals came through our Christian faith. What about universities? Yes, their origin was the Bible. What did they teach in the first universities? Theology. That's where they came from. Higher learning. Uh, literacy of the masses. Everybody being able to read. Where does it come from? Christianity. Um, where, where does the sense of property and ownership come from? There's Christian principles, of course. Uh, what about the idea of representative government, democratic society? Where does it come from? It comes out of this book. You can just go on and on. Where do our civil liberties and the maintenance of our liberties come? Out of this book. We talk about the uh, abolition of the slave trade and so on. Out of this book. I've got down in this list the origins of modern science. There are people today that science and religion are incompatible. They are not, because it was Christian people who laid the basis of modern science. Voyages of discovery and all that came out of that by Christian men. Respect for the treatment of women, benevolence, charity, good Samaritan, Higher standards of justice, I race through these. Improvements in the conditions of the common man. Condemnation of adultery, homosexuality and all that sort of thing out of this book. High regard for human life. Great developments in the realms of art and music and literature. Uh, the, the setting down of nation, national languages came out of this book. You could just go on and on and on despised, cast aside ignorantly. How long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity 
and seek after lies. David knew all about this in this struggle he was experiencing at this time. Then um, I'll go to verse 4. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Stand in awe and sin not. This would apply to our churches. Stand in awe and sin not. It touches on a conversation some of us were having just before the service. How many churches can you go to today where you feel a sense of awe, the greatness, the majesty, the dominion, the authority, the spotless holiness of God, the otherworldliness of God. Not many. It used to be you went into church or chapel and there was silence. And you bowed your head. Still the same here, thank you. You bowed your head. You acknowledge God was in this place. Yes, we know God feels immensity. But he is there when his people gather. He would be there in the midst and we should recognize it. He used to come out in our hymns. One famous hymn was this. Lo, God is here. Let us adore and own how holy is this place. You get it in our own hymn book here. Great God, right at the beginning of the book, great God, how infinite thou art. What worthless worms are we? And so it goes on. You could, you know, God is our Father which art in heaven. Our Saviour taught us to say that. And it is absolutely true. But he is our Father which art in heaven. It's a very familiar description of God, isn't it, in one sense? And as a father pitieth his children, even so the Lord. But at the same time, there is due reverence to this all-holy, almighty, all-powerful God. And so it should be. He is the holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. And we mustn't forget that for one moment. You know, when our Lord Jesus walked this earth, there were those, plenty of them, that despised him. He was despised and rejected of men. He was. And the scribes and the Pharisees and others mocked him. But you know, if you read those passages carefully, though they mocked him, though they rejected him, though they crucified him, there was still something about him that they were frightened about. They knew in their heart of hearts, so how their behavior didn't reflect it. But they knew in their heart of hearts there was something about this individual that made him more than any ordinary man. And what about the centurion that stood there watch as he died? No doubt a pagan, no doubt his heart was seared with a hot iron in many respects. He'd seen cruelty and it didn't affect him hardly at all. And he saw this man dying, hanging there in terrible suffering. But through all that, he cried out, surely or truly, this man was the son of God. It'd been better if he'd have said, is the son of God. But something of our Lord's divinity and holiness manifestly, clearly shone through. And we have lost that today. John Henry Jowett, I don't know whether you've heard of him, but he was once the minister of Cars Lane Chapel in Birmingham. Before, I hasten to add, it went liberal and uh, lost its uh, true biblical basis. He was there before that happened. And he made a comment about hymns, I'm going back a hundred years. 
He said, um, we don't like the hymns that speak of the majesty of God these days, he said. I'm talking about 1900. It's a long time ago now. We prefer the sweet and gentle and soothing hymns. Well, there's nothing wrong with sweet and gentle and soothing him, but you can't have that all the time. He said, you can't drink sweet cordial all the time, the way he put it. You need to have the two. You need to have this sense of the presence of God. And um, somebody else said this, same period. This is another quote. They said, those who make Comfort, the great subject of their preaching, seem to mistake the purpose of their ministry. Now, don't get me wrong. There is tremendous comfort, you know, in true gospel ministry. What greater comfort could there be than to announce that if we repent, our sins are forgiven through the merits, the mercies, the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the comfort of all comforts. But this still stands. Those who may come for the great subject of their ministry seem to mistake the purpose of it. Holiness is the great end and purpose. Comfort is a cordial. But no one drinks cordials, cordials from morning to night. There need to be the two. We need to feel the reverence and the power. Somebody else, Thomas Boston, the Scotsman, he gave a, a fishing illustration of this. He said, the fisherman drops his nets into the sea to catch the fish. But he won't catch any fish unless he puts leads on the top of his nets. The nets have to sink down into the water before he's going to catch any fish on them. And we need the message of we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ as well as come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give thee rest. Verse 4 again. Commune with your own heart upon your bed, and be still, Silah. Commune with your own heart upon your bed, and be still, Silah. We mentioned Richard Baxter to the children. We may not agree with everything Richard Baxter said, but he was a great man nevertheless. And he said this, that Christians should be, or Christians are the best preachers to their own hearts. Christians should be the best preachers to their own hearts. We should talk to ourselves. We should, as it says here, commune with your own heart upon your bed. And before you go to sleep, when there are no distractions from anywhere, hopefully, or when you wake up early in the morning when there are no distractions from anywhere else, commune with your own heart upon your bed and see in the silence, Lord, is there any wicked way in me? And I can tell you from my own experience that when you do that, you will find there is, well, there are wicked ways in you. And you will reflect and know that very often you're the hypocrite of all hypocrites. You will reflect and know that there are many things you've done that you are not to have done. And there are many things you left uh, undone that you should have done. We commune with our hearts upon our bed. Henry Law, years ago, wrote a little commentary on these verses. Pardon me if I read you a bit. He said, be wise. See these precepts which are taught here on the greatness and the majesty and the power of our God, Jehovah. Tremble in awe at his almightiness, he says. Let holy dread repress each rebel thought. His arm is raised against all sin. 
Flee sin as it surely is destructive. Remember when tempted to sin, sin destroys you. Detect the secret whispers of sin. Sin whispers. Why don't you do that? Why? What about this? You could easily do that. Beware. Don't be deceived by these inclinations which come, seem to be, you don't know where they're from, but they're the inclinations of sin, you see. Nip evil in its earliest bud. bud. Be still in the retirement of night's tranquil hours and examine your own heart. Well, he's right. It's what we're trying to say here. And then it goes on in verse 5. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Don't be worried. I'm not going to spend a long time on all these other verses. We will get finished at the right time. But there it is. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Now, when we talking here about the sacrifices of righteousness, we can remind ourselves that there is but one, but one true sacrifice. And that is the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. He died once and for all on the cross for all those who put their trust in him. And if we are seeking our sins to be forgiven, he is that atoning sacrifice. He is the one who takes away our sin, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. But then you may say, ah, but you've changed the word of the text. It says sacrifices, not sacrifice. You're jumping to the sacrifice of Christ from what it says here, sacrifices. But we're not doing that. Because we remind ourselves that in the Old Testament times, there were many, many sacrifices offered day after day, morning and evening, the morning and evening sacrifice. There must have been thousands of gone, thousands of sacrifices over the years. That's what it's talking about here. But there's more to it than that. All the sacrifices of the Old Testament foresaw were pointing towards, were the types of the one and only sacrifice, Jesus Christ. So we're not distorting the text when we say we can read, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord as referring to that one sacrifice that all these others typified, the sacrifice of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And it's in him we, we put our hope. Just to change that picture slightly for a second, let's just go back to Absalom, this uh, son who so broke his father's heart. There back in Jerusalem, David now fled into the desert. I wonder, I don't know whether this is true or not, but I wonder if Absalom, in the absence of his father, who every day offered the sacrifices, as I've just been speaking about, every day. I wonder if Absalom, when he said to himself, I am now the king of Israel, I'll offer those sacrifices, just as my father did. Were those sacrifices accepted from him? I doubt it. <laughs> the sacrifices of God must be from a pure and clean heart. I just mentioned that. It reminds us to be careful we're not hypocrites. But then we'll go very quickly through these last verses. Verse 6. There be many that say who will show us any good. There will be many who will say show us any, any good. I just say one thing. Are you good at complaining? Well, I am anyway. <laughs> we, we talk about people who are grousing all the time, don't we? People grumbling pessimists. We are every single one of us guilty of it. 
There'll be many who will say, show us any good. Well, maybe we feel better after we've had a good complaint, but we shouldn't really be doing it. We need to watch ourselves. Not that we shouldn't criticize things that are bad, but if we just keep saying, oh dear, oh dear, it's not healthy. Then it goes on and says, Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Lift up the light of thy countenance upon us. We should pray that every day. Lord, lift up the light of thy countenance upon us. That we could catch a glimpse, a fresh glimpse of God. No man hath seen God at any time. But we, we know what we mean. If each day we could see some new, gain some new understanding of the nature of God, some new truth out of God's word, some new understanding what it took to deal with our sins, what Christ did for us on the cross, all those sort of things. Lift thou up the light of thy countenance, smile upon us, be gracious unto us. Have mercy upon us is a daily prayer. Thou hast put gladness, verse 7, in my heart, more than the time that their corn and their wine increased. What a change has come over David. This is, it seems, the day after the worst day of his life. And now he's saying, Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. There's a great peace come upon this man sometimes a light surprises said Cowper or Cooper the Christian while he sings it is the Lord who rises with healing in his wings when comforts are declining he grants the soul again a season of clear shining to cheer it after rain have you experienced that he did and finally I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. He lies down and sleeps after all this. Same again as he alluded to in the previous psalm. I'll end with this. There's a story about Nicholas Ridley, the famous martyr, 1500 to 1555. He was in his better days, the Bishop of London under Edward VI. But then, of course, came along Queen Mary and she had him arrested, sentenced to death. You can read about him in Fox's Book of Martyrs. And uh, he was locked up and um, being kind, these persecutors, I say that in inverted commas, they allowed well, his brother, I should say, wanted permission to, to spend the, his, uh, Ridley's last night in the cell before he was burned at the stake. His brother offered to go and sleep there, if, if there could be any sleep, uh, and be with him that night before his death. Well, they granted permission for that to happen, but Ridley refused it. He didn't want, not that he had anything against his brother, but he said, no, this is what he said, that he meant to go to bed and sleep as soundly as he had done in his life so far, the night before he was burned at the stake. When the Bible says these things, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. It's not just giving us some nice words or some nice rounding off of this psalm. It's talking about realities. I know we don't always experience these things. We're poor specimens, all of us. But these true men of God and women of God, and no doubt some of us at times have experienced it, that in spite of all the chaos around us and the things that threaten us, in Christ, we can lay down in peace and sleep. And what about the final day when we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that day of 
Thou judge of quick and dead, before whose bar severe, with holy joy or guilty dread, we all at last must appear. Nobody ever sings that hymn now, going back to that subject. But we will lay down and sleep, because we're safe. For Christ has died in the sinner's place, and there is there now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Well, may God bless these thoughts and expositions of these two great psalms. Hello, friends.